I have immense pleasure in introducing the eminent philatelist, Dr. Peter P. McCann, RDP FRPSL from United States of America. Dr. Peter McCann, in 2007, signed the role of distinguished philatelist, RDP, recipient of the Alfred F. Dickenstein Memorial Award 2010 for service to philately, received John N. Luff Award for 2008 for outstanding services to the American Philatelic Society, Bernard A. Henning, AAPE Award 2012 for Excellence and Improvement in Philatelic Judging, recipient of the FIP Medal of Service 2016, past president of the American Philatelic Society, APS, and current APS Secretary, past director and vice president of FIP 2004-2016. Mr. McCann has served as a juror at FIP International World Exhibition, Postal History and Traditional Classes. Served as team leader, jury vice president, FIP consultant, jury secretary, president of the jury, New York 2016. His collecting interests are postal history of several British Caribbean islands currently exhibiting Dominica. He has exhibited nationally, won eight grand awards, three reserve grand awards, and internationally, and published more than 50 articles and three books. I welcome Dr. McCann and over to you, Mr. McCann. Thank you. Uh, this is a seminar I'm gonna talk about is traditional philately. And traditional philately, to keep in mind, traditional equates with stamps. So the focus of traditional exhibits are looking specifically at the stamps and how they're used. It is, it's not postal history, it's not a, other, it's stamps. Okay. So what I'm going to do is break this down into how are traditional philatelic exhibits evaluated. And they're evaluated much in exactly the same types of categories that Peter was just talking about in the, in the previous presentation. And that it, it breaks down into, for traditional philately, treatment, knowledge and research, condition and rarity, and presentation. I don't think I left any of them out. So we're going to go. So each one of those has a different number of points to meet the total and to make out what the uh, final uh, medal level is. But I'm going to go through in terms of a traditional seminar and a traditional type of collection exhibit. I'm going to go through each one of these in these different categories and give you some uh, ideas and some examples of what this means and what you might be able to do to change, improve, do whatever. And remember, the final, you can listen to all the experts you want about what to do and not what to do, but the final the final decision as an exhibitor is for you to decide what you want to do and do it that way without trying to stray too far from the boundaries of what 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 you are supposed to do and not supposed to do. All right. So we're talking about the guidelines. These are over the overall general guidelines that you, if you look them up on the FIP website, what are guidelines for uh, traditional exhibits, you'll, you'll find basically a lot of what I'm talking about now. So we start out in terms of the guidelines, in terms of treatment. And let me say something about treatment. Treatment is the one category that an exhibitor has absolute control over. In other words, if somebody says, you've got a problem with your treatment, you need to change this, you can do it instantly. Almost any instantly, you can sit down and work it out and, and, and change it in your exhibit. But the other categories are, are very much constrained by what the, your choice of subject is, what you're showing, what you want to talk about, and knowledge and, 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 and research. It's constrained about what you have in the exhibit, what you know about it, what you can talk about it. Uh, rarity, you know, you get the material that you have and you show it, and you're limited to what you have or what you can get. Uh, same thing, condition, you got something in bad conditions, you can replace it. Presentation, sloppy presentation, you can fix it. Treatment, but to a, to a certain extent. But in treatment, you always have the ability to work, work with your exhibit, change it, emphasize different things, and do that. So treatment is, is yours to do what you want to do with it. So let's start off with the introduction page. The introduction page is horrendously important. Because think about it, it's the one thing that your judges and your viewers, when your viewers start looking at the exhibit, that's the first thing that they see. The judges see it several weeks, usually before the exhibition and are looking at it. And they 
get a very, very important first glimpse or idea of what the exhibit's about. So your introduction page has to be very good, very clear, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of these things, but the, judge, the, the page should look, purpose of the exhibit, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to show? And just saying, well, I'm showing a first issue or second issue of uh, some country. Well, no, that's not enough. What are you trying to do to show in this exhibit? You also have to define the scope and you'd be surprised how many exhibitors don't do that, but you have to say, where does it start? Where does it end? And explain what's gonna be in it. And then you explain how it's organized, the plan. Any, any exhibit should have organization and sections and what you're doing and the structure of how those sections are laid out. It all should be in, it's gotta be in the title page and you can do it in a fairly simple way. And somebody reading that will say, oh yeah, I get it. I get what they're trying to do. All right, here's some examples of, of showing uh, the, the, uh, the scope and what the, what's going to be seen in a, in a sentence. This is a, uh, from an exhibit of Tasmania, uh, classic issues, first issues of Tasmania. So the purpose, here we go, exhibits to tell the story about production, production and use of stamps in Tasmania from the very first local stamps of 1853. Next, uh, the Chalong issues, the side face issues, and it talks about the, the scope. The end of the exhibit is the last issued Victoria stamps of Tasmania, and they were printed uh, by the government printing office in Melbourne in 1907. Very, very clear example of what, what, the, what the scope of the exhibit is. Okay, in terms of guidelines, again, you have to choose a subject that enables you to have a balanced exhibit to be shown in the space available. Well, the space available means how many frames are you are you aiming for this exhibit to be? In other words, it, usually most of us work with five or eight frame exhibits. Those are sort of the classic two, two sizes of exhibits. In different places in the United States where I happen to live, we, uh, we are able to show any number of frames that we want to up to 10. Uh, I find sometimes 10 frame exhibits are a little bit thin, they're, they're stretched out. But anyway, you can show what you want. But you have your subject, what you're going to put into this exhibit, has to fit the space. You don't want to have a frame of showing pretty much the same thing, all the same thing, or the same type of thing, because you have a, uh, you know, you have an eight-frame exhibit. Don't do that. It's better to cut down a frame and and show it in a in a more uh, terse and clear uh, manner. The content of the exhibit has to reflect what you said it's going to be. Simply translated, that means make sure when you clearly define your title, purpose, scope, and plan that what you actually have in the exhibit fits all of that. I mean, sometimes people uh, go and do the title, purpose, scope, and plan. They figure it all out, and then they go and get the material and put it in there, and they realize that what they plan to do or what they're trying to show doesn't exactly fit what's in the exhibit, or what you decide to put into the exhibit as material doesn't exactly come fit what you've originally done as the uh, as the as the uh, the scope and the plan and so on and so forth so what happens i think to most people is in fact they 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 have a proposal of how to organize your exhibit you go, and i do this myself you organize the exhibit you see what material you have what stamps you have what covers you have put it together in a sense that makes it together just you know by hand and put it on a table or something see what you got and maybe what you actually have doesn't exactly fit what you uh, thought theoretically you want to do. So it's probably easier to change your plan and purpose than it is to go and get the material to fit the original plan and purpose. I'm being, I'm being a little not serious here, but you understand what I'm saying. Another thing, it's very important on the headlines on each page that's in, a, in an exhibit like this, a traditional exhibit or postal history exhibit as well. The headlines, the headings on the page support the understanding of the treatment. What that means is that your treatment is, you said and defined what it is, but if somebody's looking at a page in the middle of the exhibit and it's got a heading on it, that's kind of vague or just says, gives a description of what's on, repeats what's basically the material that you're showing on the page, but it doesn't actually make, the, make you understand how the exhibit is moving along. Think about it. So you've got to have headings and subheadings on every page that reflect, you know, what the progression is of the exhibit and what you want it to be. And the worst thing you can do is just put in a page 
that has no headings on it. It's just up there and you have material that's ex explained and you say, so somebody walking, the, the ideal idea is somebody walks up to your exhibit, looks at a page and it's very clear what it's about and what it relates to the title. The worst thing that can happen is you walk up, somebody walks up to and looks what's on the page and says, I don't understand what 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 are what's this about? What does it relate to the the section of the the the, the title of this of this section of the exhibit? Okay, you got to have a logical storyline created with the text and material with a good balance between the different parts of the exhibit. So that's a formal way of saying is when you organize your exhibit and you have various sections in it major sections and most exhibits are divided mine uh, any traditional exhibits are divided into four or five major sections of the topic that they're going to uh, in terms of a traditional exhibit it would be a printing of stamps and then it would be uh, varieties and so on and so forth make sure that the storyline uh that 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 your material is balanced and what i'm saying is if you have a for example, in an exhibit that has four or five major sections that you've defined on your introductory page, you have five sections, and then you go look, somebody goes and looks at the exhibit. Section two has material that's two and a half frames, and section three has four pages. Okay, there's a little bit out of balance here. You're, you're, <clears throat> you've created by making that three page sec, uh, material a section, and somebody's going to wonder, well, why the hell is these three pages? In terms of the division of the of the of the exhibit, why is it as important as this two and a half frames? Probably you've not correctly defined the sections, and you got to go back and look and make sure that those three pages maybe really aren't part of the same section before it or the section after it. With a di but is in a different. It would be a subsection. I, I know I'm, I'm talking about kind of abstract things here, but I, I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. Oh, let's go back. Uh, okay, this is going through uh, in a traditional exhibit, a couple of examples of describing and saying what you have on each page. And a lot of traditional exhibitors tend to fall in a little bit of a trap as they have things like this, which is a, a, an essay for the, the design of these ta Tasmania stamps I'm talking about. And they just put it in and they put a, a little heading saying, essays or something like that. You have to be in a traditional exhibit when you're talking about the stamps, tell the story of the stamps. So this was the, this is an essay or a, an example of a, of a previous design that was used to do this key page design that wound up being two Tasmania stamps. So the, the uh, description next to this essay says exactly what it is. The Delarue company had a, 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 in 1888, had a key plate design with Imperium as a sample name. Okay. In the Delarue office, they made some sketches and they hand painted in, in this sample thing, they hand painted in the uh, word trans Tasmania for be a Tasmania issue. And also uh, the denomination is changed color. The denomination is six pennies. Okay. The design was approved by the T Tasmania, then Tasmania post office and other authorities. And that order went into Delarue to print with this design a two and a half penny stamp and a five penny stamp. Okay. This showing these examples in the exhibit with this little explanation, very simple, just a sentence or two, really, really makes it clear what you're doing and, and the, the history of it instead of just saying examples of essays. Okay. Then we get into the proofs and the uh, the two values, for example, were then engraved in steel, and they have this is proof uh, printing of the of the two engraving, the two and a half and the five. You show these, yeah. But before hardening, the value was removed from the five pennies issue, shown on the right. And new value tablets were, were engraved for the five penny. In the coming years, other other values could be placed in the same design and changed all the way up to to ten pennies. Very simple sentences, but it's very clear what's going on with these uh, essays and proofs. And finally, they printed the final stamps and they show examples of the stamps in this traditional exhibit. They show the example, they show the block of, of two and a half penny stamps. 
and a uh, example of the, what is it, the five penny stamp yacht. But they also say there were two, two million, four hundred thousand, so on and so forth, of the two and a half penny stamps and a million, two hundred thirty six thousand. So you are automatically getting a clue, uh, not only the, about the stamps and when they were printed, but the, what the, the, the uh, availability and maybe and to some extent the rarity that there's going to be a lot fewer of those five penny stamps around than there will be the two and a half penny stamps. And then they say they were printed and sent to for to Tasmania for use in 1892. Th th these explanations on the left there are very simple, but they're very, very important to put that in when you're discussing the production of the stamps. It shows a lot of not it'll it helps all the way down the line in terms of uh, treatment because it also gives some indication of rarity and knowledge that you have as an exhibitor what you're showing. Okay, remember, traditional exhibit, big equal sign, and the focus is on the stamps, stamps, how they were issued, and then secondarily on other things, how the stamps were used. Usage is very, very important, but sometimes exhibitors get carried away with the usage uh, of the stamps in a traditional exhibit and make almost mini postal history exhibits that really don't relate to the stamps. They relate to the use of the stamps in terms of its postal history and you lose a little bit focus of the stamps. We're gonna talk about that later. Okay, but uh, the completeness of the material shown in relation to the scope of the stamps. Now, what does that mean? It means you've defined a scope and said it's going to have certain elements in it, make sure that you show the material that has all the elements that one would expect. So make sure what, you, what you've got in the exhibit is uh, within the, uh, fits in the scope and fills in any blanks in the, in the scope that you say you're going to have. Another important thing is, and I know this may seem obvious to you, you say, well, I know that, of course. Well, you know, sometimes people don't or they don't think about it. There's got to be a natural start and ending point of the exhibit. Sounds very simple, but some people I've gotten seen exhibits where it ends and I say, why are we ending here? And then you have to run all the way back to the title page and you see the scope and you say, oh yeah, this is that last extra set of stamps that they added on in the end to fill in because of a color change and they put these three stamps in the end and that's why the exhibit ends. What you do is at that page at the end, you actually say that this study, uh, these, this study of stamps uh, ends with the issue of these three provisional or these three stamps that were a color change due to various rates related to the UPU or something. Explain that. Duplicated material. Okay. This is, is a, a little bit of a, 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 not a pet peeve of mine, but how many times have I seen uh, somebody show a very unusual or rare stamp or cover, and you get, oh boy, that that exhibit's got this really great, you know, really great stamp or very unusual stamp. Or look at that usage; that's really, really good. And then you go on and you see the next three or four pages in the exhibit has the same thing being shown again. And you get to the point where you see at the end, you say, okay, I believe you. I know you have it, but don't you don't need to duplicate. To, to prove that you've got some really good stuff. And if you do, uh, a judge looking at it would say, why is he showing, I, I know it's a great thing, but why are there six of these here? What, what's the point? And then you you get at the back of your mind, well, maybe he's or she is padding this exhibit a little bit because they don't have you know, something else to show. And, it's, and there's all of these duplications. So uh, you have to be careful just because you have it and it's really good. You don't have to show every single copy of it. And if you do show duplications of it, you explain what's different about this particular example than the one you showed before. And that, that, that if there, and there usually is something. Okay, we're gonna talk about duplications for a minute. And uh, uh, you, you'll, see, you'll see what I'm talking about. So here's, this is a, a first issue, early issue of Denmark. And here's a very nice first day cover uh, sent uh, to another town in Denmark. 1851, the first stamp is used. And here's another cover with the same stamp sent to a different place in Denmark. And then here's another one, third one, another place in Denmark. Here's a fourth one, two, change of the letter rate, okay? Another place in Denmark. Here's three, three things with a triple rate showing another place in Denmark. 
here's a four triple place in Denmark. And you can imagine all of these in the same thing. Okay, here's uh, again talking, I'll, I'll get back to the duplications in a minute, but I just want to show you what you don't need to do. You pick one or two of these and do it. Oh, okay, here's a, a letter sent uh, 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 to Copenhagen from a town in Denmark. It's a beautiful letter. It talks about the four uh, skilling domestic letter rate. It's a when it went, uh, the cancel and mixed ranking, everything. Let's look at this one, another one. Same issue in Denmark. It's got five examples of the stamp on it. It's going to Germany from Den uh, to, well, what, what was Danzig? It was <coughs> Germany as a country didn't exist. And of course, uh, so there's a great cover with lots of stamps on it. And here's all the, the rate and the uh, down here and, you know, the copy and the mixed rank and, and everything. Here's another one, four of the early stamps. Uh, another two, uh, two, um, Copenhagen to another town in Denmark. Okay, and here's another one from Lübeck to one of the German city-states, uh, not far from Copenhagen, beautiful cover. Here's all of the uh, the information about it. Seven was recorded and it went the rate and how much the rate was. Another one, I'm not, ex don't read all this stuff. I'm just showing you, here's, here's another one, duplication. Okay, besides, if you think about it quickly, Besides the, all the duplications, well, some really, really nice covers, but showing all of those in, as, as a usage in a, in a traditional exhibit is not a very good idea. But did you catch something else when I was just going through those very quickly? And here's the question. Besides duplications, what was wrong with all the items? Well, there was something wrong. No traditional treatment. Nothing about the stamps themselves. Nothing about the printings of those stamps that were shown on those covers. Nothing about the color. There were some color changes on, on in that issue. Nothing about the plating. Only destinations, routes, rates, and postmarks in all of those. All postal history information. Traditional philately is about stamps. So this is a couple of slides to give you an indication Remember, if it's a traditional exhibit, you're talking about showing the stamps in terms of the usage, not of the postal history. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't show knowledge about any cover. Obviously, we're talking about covers now because a, a single stamp won't, won't tell you about much about the postal history element. But a... a, a a postal history explanation is not good, but if you can put the cover in there as a part of the traditional showing the use of the stamps in an interesting way with uh, printings, colors, and things mentioning that, and then as a subcategory, explain the postal history, then you've, you, you fulfill the requirement of talking about it in a traditional context but also showing knowledge that you do understand <clears throat> it's not just a stamp on a cover for usage, it's a stamp on a cover and you explain that you know what the cover was all about. So you explain it, but the organization of where you put that cover inside your traditional exhibit depends on the discussion of the, of the use of the stamp and when it was used and when it was printed and so on and so forth. And you have to say all of that, but underneath, so to speak, you can talk about your knowledge of much more about the cover. But it's it's where you how you organize it and put it into the exhibit that's important. Okay, let's talk, and I'm I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I want to so let's move on to the next. Uh, we we've given you some I've given you some ideas about uh, treatment. Let's talk about importance. Importance is ten points, and importance is really in a terms of evaluating the exhibit is probably not as important as a lot of various articles and discussions that I say, oh, the importance and how do you do this? And it's that's not important and it's a small country, so it's not important. And there's 10 points involved here. Okay, so how difficult in terms of importance for part of the 10 points, how difficult is a selected area to collect in, in general? That's part of the importance. What is the significance of the material actually shown in the exhibit 
relative to the selective area. You know, you're, you're, you're saying I'm going to show this and that because it's it's important in this particular, I think it's important in this particular category, but what you're actually showing, does it really fit the, the definition that you want to make that it's important? Sometimes it, it can be important in the selected area, but what you're actually showing isn't particularly important in and of itself for that category. Then you can say what, another thing in terms of importance is what's the significance of the selected area relative to the national philately of that country? And I give you an example, and I think it, I think I hope it's obvious what that means. It means that if you decide to do a study of the second issue of uh, uh, Spain, okay, classic issue of Spain, it's a really really important, you know, it's it's important in the development of the philately and so on and so forth. And or you decide to do an issue of uh, a definitive issue of stamps in the early 20th century that uh, was a you know, design of some buildings in Spain and the design was out for, you know, was used, it was definitive stamps, but it was used for about two years from 1930 to 1933. And then it was uh, dis dis discontinued because the post office, uh, that it was not, they didn't like the designs or something. Obviously the second issue of Spain is a lot more in, uh, important, quote unquote, than that two year 1930 issue of Spain. So that that's giving you a very black and white definition of significance of a selected area. The, the last one here is the significance of the selected area relative to world philately. Now, I, I have some problems with automatically defining that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the philately of India, okay, is much more important than the philately of Mauritius. Yeah, it's a much more important country and it's got much more postal history. But, you know, if somebody does a really, really good job of uh, showing the uh, classic issues of Mauritius with all of the, orig the original two post office stamps that were issued and everything in it, and you, and in, in world philately, is Mauritius actually particularly important? No, but a certain piece of that is really, really important. And it, goes fits in other categories so automatically saying that a much bigger country with much more stamp issues is more important than a small island that uh that really has only limited number of parts of stamp so be be very careful about uh, this selected area relative to world philately and what's important in world philately or not now i have to give you my own biases i happen to show postal history uh, my own per personal collections uh, and exhibits have been postal history of small British islands that have issue stamps. So I'm very much sensitive to the fact about how important small places, small islands are, but we can talk about that a little bit later. I mean, privately. Okay. Now, let me show you these four categories that I talked about. This is how it kind of breaks down uh, that the, the first the idea would be the first two are worth five to six points of importance and the second two are worth four to uh, five to four points of importance to equal 10 okay and that's how you kind of divvy it up uh, yes and no and there i will just take a minute to digress and say there's 10 points in importance and in all the years that I have been judging national shows and international shows, the range of importance that I see in exhibits that are that, that are entered in national competition or international competition, the range of total points of importance, I really rarely see anything below a six and total and for exhibit and re re relatively rarely see anything more than nine. To get a 10 in importance, you've got to be, you know, penny blacks or, I mean, it's really got to be tremendously important in every sense of the word to get a 10. You don't see 10s very often, but you do. I mean, some of them they are. Okay, so, but if we talk about it in a practical sense, the range of important points that you one actually sees in most e exhibitions is between six and nine total. So what you're talking about, really, when you when you're judging importance, is it, does an exhibit get six, seven, or eight, eight or nine? I mean, right in that, in the middle. 
only three or four points that really are sort of in play. So that, that's what I said when we started talking about importance. Importance sometimes isn't really that important, but it, it can be. Those extra points for importance can make a difference in the mental level sometimes. But so I'm not going to talk about importance anymore. <laughs> All right. Knowledge, this knowledge and rarity, 35 points. That's, that's the big, the, the elephant in the room, as we say is sometimes. There, if you do a good job with your knowledge and show what you've got and explain it and do show some research, you can get a lot of points, even with a exhibit that maybe isn't considered, quote unquote, not very important. It's teasing a little bit here. Okay, 35 points. Philatelic and related knowledge. That have to remember, first thing, the choice of items that you put into your exhibit reflects the knowledge of the chosen area. Think about that. What does that mean? That actually means what you put in your exhibit and show and are there and it's there that a judge or a viewer goes up and looks at it and says, oh, man, this person, he or she really did a good job. They've covered the whole subject. They've got the good pieces. They they have put it together. They've explained it. And but what's being shown reflects the exhibitor's knowledge of the chosen area. And, and the, the contrary point of that would be you go up and look at it and say, what the hell? This person, you know, there's a whole section of of the of these stamps that uh, issue that he shows one or two examples. And there's there's eight different varieties of this in the printings and stuff. And he doesn't have or she doesn't have any of that. Well, he just covers it very superficially. OK, that's where you go and say that exhibitor is not showing the knowledge of the chosen area. And you say to the exhibitor, well, you didn't show all of this. You didn't say that. Well, I, I I didn't think I needed to. Well, yeah, you did need to say something, either say something about it, why you're not showing it, or show it. Otherwise, we say maybe you didn't know about that or understand that and didn't put it in. Ah, you get lose points for importance, uh, not importance for for knowledge. Or on the other hand, this everything is there, and they say, wow, that's not a very exciting subject in some ways, you know, we judges have our biases too, but we, we try to be fair in, in any exhibit that we look at, but doesn't, you know, that's really, but that person has really covered that topic very well and really knows what to show and what needs to be shown. Okay, they're gonna get, they're gonna get some ex bonus points there and knowledge. Okay, the other thing is you gotta describe what you're showing. You know, if you don't, if you don't say what it is clearly, you're not gonna. You're not necessarily gonna get knowledge credit for showing it if you don't say exactly what it is and make sure that the viewer looks at it. Okay, this this is also something else in terms of knowledge. Reference to existing existing literature and important collectors of the area, and it says on the introductory page or on the synopsis. Well, I've I've gone back and forth with some of my colleagues who are judges on this, I don't really think it's a real good idea on the introductory page to put a whole list of references or, you know, I've seen them, the, you know, at the bottom there, you know, 25% of the page is just listed with references. That's, that's not where a judge needs it. The judge needs it if you want to really give some good references and explain it, put it in the, in the synopsis, which is not something that actually goes up with the exhibit. It's something, it's information that the judge uh, that the exhibitor is providing to the judge ahead of time. Now, not every country and every place uses synopsis, and that's okay. But if you if you do use a synopsis, that's the obvious place to put a bunch of references. My personal feeling is if you've got some reference or something uh, that is important that you want them to understand that maybe that reference refers to something that you, as an exhibitor, did some own personal research and it reflects, it's reflected in that reference, or in fact, it, that was the basis for the conclusion that you came to about the research. And it's important that the, that the viewer be aware that you're a, you, you know about this reference. What I do and what I recommend to people do, put a little tiny footnote at the bottom of the page that's, that's important for this particular reference and just say 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 something about it say you know da 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 little small font way at the bottom put it in parentheses or something judge will look at that and say oh yeah okay that's good he he saw that or they saw that so that's good all right 
And this is again, pretty obvious, but the exhibit should demonstrate a full and accurate understanding of the subject chosen. Uh, that, that kind of relates to the first point there, that the choice of items reflects the knowledge. Well, it really should demonstrate that you understand what you've done and what you're doing, and uh, it's clear. Okay, now here's an example. Uh, th th I wanna show you this cover, uh, knowledge. Uh, and it, 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 it also relates to uh, traditional exhibit. You notice they put this cover in, uh, the Tasmania cover, and the description below the cover says, letter front with four penny plate number two, position 19, very early printing stage with a clear impression. What is that? In bolded letters and in a, a short sentence, it is a traditional explanation about the stamp on the cover. So it, it would go into, it fit into the cover relate relative to where the exhibit is talking about that particular four penny stamp. Now below that, if you see down there, there's five lines, that's five lines of postal history information. So you have as an exhibitor, put the cover, the item in the right place in the exhibit in terms of traditional structure, but you're also showing your knowledge about that cover and an understanding of it by below that, putting in the postal history information there, you can see it uh, and saying, hey, yeah, I, I use this cover to, to, as a traditional example of this stamp being used, but I sure understand what this is all about. And uh, I can explain you know, where the cover went and what it's about. And that, again, the judge was looking at that say, well, okay, the, the knowledge that he shows about this material is in the right, is there and we like it. And also you get the credit in terms of the treatment of putting the, the emphasis as the location of this cover in, 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 in a usage. So, all right. There's, these are some things to just, we'll, we'll just touch on them. Personal studies and research and research. Some of the things that you can talk about as st personal study in, in terms of a traditional exhibit, you're talking about the issuing process of the stamps, to demonstrate with essays, dye proofs, plate proofs, colored trials, plate flaws, all of the above. If you don't have some of these things like the dye proofs or plate proofs, uh, they, they either don't exist or they're, they're in museums or whatever, say that so that you don't have a, a judge looking and say, well, he doesn't have any plate proofs, you know, and the exhibitor, you say to the exhibitor later, you didn't have any plate proofs. Well, they don't exist. And the judge would say, okay, well, I, did, I didn't know that. So I think you need to explain that, that plate proofs are not, uh, are not available. Okay. Other things that, that you can show, other things that you can show knowledge about are, types, uh, printing plates, plating issues, treated on stamps and overprints with issuing dates and volumes, okay? Show that. You can also show, uh, talk about gum, watermark, paper, perforation, okay? The reasons for issuing the stamp is documented with correct usage explanation of rates, routes, and cancellations. That was on the cover that I just showed you a minute ago uh, where it was, in the correct position in the exhibit in terms of usage, but you can show knowledge by documenting the, uh, the, the quote unquote, the other aspects of cancellations and routes and rates of route. And the final thing, thing here is research and new discoveries carried out about by the exhibitor should be given full co coverage in accordance with their importance. This is really, really important in terms of helping you with your knowledge and research uh, points, so to speak. How many times have I seen an exhibit that's got some really good knowledge in terms of treatment or in postal history? They um, they explain something they they've done in gone into it and they say, "Oh, that's really interesting and that's good and something," but they don't give themselves credit for having done it. They just put it in there and they think, "Well, the exhibitor really did a good job in finding out about uh, you know pulling that out of a reference somewhere and putting that in there. That's very good." But you know, if if the judge looks at that and set and realizes the exhibitor actually did this work and it's his or her work, then they're going to say, "Wow, okay, that's a lot of original research, uh, specific to the exhibitor." 
So please, uh, you know, please, please make it clear that when you have done something that's yours and, and it's a credit to you as, a, as a, an exhibitor, ex make sure that the viewer, the judge understands that. And you say, well, how do I do that? It's very simple. You simply say at the bottom there on the, where on the page near the co cover of the stamp, you say original research by the exhibitor. You use three words. It, that, you say, well, I can't say that. Yes, you can. If you don't say it, who's going to say it? You know? So you can't say that. And you can say it in a very discreet way. Some exhibitors use a little, uh, I've seen a little icon that has a book on it or something. And then they, on the title page and directory page, they define, if you see this book, symbol that means original research by the exhibitor, whatever, but just make sure you get credit for what you've done yourself. Okay, quality, uh, translate that. Uh, some people use quality, some people use condition. That's 10 points. Okay, so the stamps you should look for in the best possible conditions, look for in terms of quality, you want don't wanna have missing perforations, you would like to on unperforated stamps have a margin on all the sides and you want to have nice, clear cancellations. Sounds obvious, but you know, you want to do it. If it's the only way you can get something, then you just put it in there and make it clear that this is a very unusual. Uh, okay, here's some examples of some of these margins, really good uh, postal stationery, really nice big margins on perforated and perforated stamps. Here's Big, big margins on this unperforated stamp. And here, well, nice Van Diemen, remember Van Diemen's Land is, uh, is a pre, the first name for Tasmania. Uh, so you have very thin touching the edge here. You know, it's a good stamp. Is it, uh, I, if you gave this a 10, would you give this 10 points? If, if you were just rating one stamp in terms of points, nah, you know, that's sort of maybe an eight. I'm just saying it's not, it's, you know, but this is the only way you got it, then you show it. And here, here's a block of nine. And on the right, you know, the margins are a little thin and on the bottom, their margins are, you know, it's cutting into the stamp. But a block of nine, you know, so the, the, the scarcity of the item outweighs the problem of the, situation or the fact that it's not the greatest uh, uh, you know, it's in terms of the condition. But uh, here's here the stamp. It's got all the margins. It's tight and close, but it's a very nice cover. The writing is good. Okay. And just what I said, the quality may be compromised in terms of quality or condition for unique and very rare material. I think that's very, very obvious and if if it's really very rare and if the quality really you look at it and say yeah, um, <laughs> explain it or something. So this is very rare. Okay, modern material if modern twentieth century mid twentieth century on to the current day, it really would be expected to be in perfect quality. And if it's not, then you have to explain why. If you have a a cover or a stamp that comes from some Pacific island that the Postal service and the office is in a building that doesn't have any windows and the in atmosphere and the salt air. You know, if there's a reason that you can't show it in perfectly, you explain. And that's interesting for the viewer to know, you know, why and what if it's not. Okay. And then another thing is obvious if an item has been restored or manipulated, in other words, changed or something done to it, um, you have to explain it because if you don't, uh, you're really going to get dinged on all, you know, it would, it would be a major problem if, <clears throat> if it, uh, if, if we figured out that we looked at something, a judge looked at something and said, oh, this has been restored or, you know, take it out of the frames and look at it. You've got to say, and sometimes you really do want to fix up a, a, ta a tatty looking cover or something and it's bad paper and get it cleaned. And if you do that, it looks much better. If you want to do that, that's fine. I, actually, it is to clean it up. As long as you don't touch the stamp or the cancellations or print or anything on it, it it's just just the paper. Just to say that you know, cover cover restored or paper restored, and put it in parentheses right, right below. Nobody, every you'll get much more credit for being honest about it. And if it really makes the the material look a lot better, then do it. But tell tell 
your audience that you've done it. Okay. So in terms of rarity, um, one, the, here's some things we'll go through. How difficult is it to obtain the interesting and material in the exhibit? This is difficulty of acquisition. It doesn't necessarily mean rarity e equates how much something costs. And uh, as you know, you can have some very rare and difficult to acquire material um, to, uh, to show. And it doesn't cost very much, but you can't find it. I mean, I look for stuff in some of my collections and exhibits. And actually, when I found it, it was, a, you know, maybe $50, $60. But it took me 10 years to find it. it just doesn't exist. So that that that's a legitimate description of something being very rare and dif difficult to acquire. Another factor in terms of rarity is how difficult is it to actually duplicate the exhibit? And a lot of, you know, and a lot of exhibits, the, again, the, actual quote unquote cash value uh, of the material that got lost insurance would you wouldn't get hundreds of thousands of dollars for it but you but you might not ever able be able to duplicate the exhibit so you can make this clear in talking about rarity or difficulty of acquisition in the body of the exhibit explain that in in a discreet way so also in rarity you want to show earliest known usage Largest blocks known, rare usage, minor printing volumes, special variety stamps and overprints. Say that so you get credit for rarity or difficulty of acquisition. Um, yeah. Here's, for example, earliest known usage of the side face issue. This is Tasmania again. So that that's that's worth pointing out. It may, may be that those stamps by themselves are not, you know, they're the good stamps and it's hard to get that issue thing. But if it's the earliest known issue of the use of the stamps, that's a big deal. And that's why it's in big bold type there. And judge look at that and say, whoa, that's really nice. First one. Okay. And it gives notice it gives some postal history information below as well. Here's a fourpenny stamp from Tasmania uh, explaining uh, in terms of the rarity, there was a certain number of copies printed. Uh, 50,000 of the 72,000 were destroyed. Only about 8,000 were distributed to the post offices. It gives an explanation of why this stamp is particularly desirable and can, could be considered rare. The cancellation, particularly on the right, that was uh, the last within the last four days of the use of the stamp when it was replaced by a different colored stamp because of the uh, postal regulations. Here's another thing. That's a, talk about lousy with paper covers, you know, but here the rarity of this huge multiple of 17, I think it's 17 stamps on um, the cover is just, uh, uh, it's just amazing. Okay, other things in terms of rarity, abnormalities in papers, watermarks, perforations are all things worth pointing out, but also we check for philatelic don't put in too much philatelically inspired material into an exhibit and or too much printer's waste. Printer's waste is not really, is really just that. It's waste. It's an interesting thing if you have a little bit of printer's waste for a stamp issue. It's it's certainly worth it to show a couple of examples of it, but don't fill a, a frame or half a frame with just printer's waste because it's just printer's waste. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about presentation for a couple of minutes. Five points, not uh, tremendously important, but presentation is very important. Okay, we'll get into, go through this in a minute, but presentation is very important in terms of first impressions. If a, as a judge, I walk up to an exhibit and I see it's a really, really nice presentation. Presentation is such that you see it there in the frames and you look at it and say, gee, I'm really looking forward to it. Look, it's really nice material and it's really laid it out very well and it's spaced and it's easy to follow and you can follow the plan and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's really nice. You get a very good impression of the exhibit and you you tend to, you tend to think mentally, oh, I'm, you know, this is good. And then if you get through it and see it's, Got some really bad defects. Okay, but you know, at least the presentation is really good. I'm I'm, I'm being a little serious, not too serious here, but I really am saying though, good presentation is really important for first impressions. If it's a terrible presentation, you have to overcome 
your prejudice against a really crappy looking pages or something to realize, hey, this is really good stuff. And the, he or she really knows how to put it together, but I wish they'd clean up the presentation. So example, what, you know, good, good balance in the frame and the individual pages, put them in a way that's, you know, the classic thing about presentation sometimes, and you see this particularly, I, I'm not knocking on postal stationery and see this, but it's very prevalent in postal stationery exhibits. You see a frame and it's called railroad tracks. It's one, one postal card after another, uh, you know, just lined like, like, like railroad tracks. And it's really boring to look at. So you break it up and you make sure that the space it out with different, you know, different, uh, different placements on a page. So it doesn't look like it's just your eyes blur when you get next to it. So that's, that's important, the balance in the frames and individual pages, uh, good use of the page, don't have too much white space. You know, you, if you too much white space elicits a reaction from a judge, what is, what is he or she not showing, okay? Careful mounting, you know, if you've got good material, don't be sloppy and when you mount it and put it, you know, it, it's just little things, but you'd be surprised at that. some really, really good exhibits. You see that they're missing a mount or on a corner, it's loose or something. Don't do that, it's so easy to fix. The write-up is clear and readable, okay. Every, almost everybody these days uses a, some sort of computer generated page. So it's we're not talking about handwriting here, but the write-up write is clear and readable. By that, I mean the major problem tends to be the big black box of text that you come up and you see 16 lines of 4.0 text in a very, very complicated font with lots of fancy tales and stuff. And it is impossible to read carefully and maybe not even without a magnifying glass. So make sure you don't do that, okay? Because it makes a difference. And then sufficient write-up I think I can go down here, careful now. Sufficient write-up, but not too much text. One of the greatest problems that we have as judges looking at exhibitors, at the exhibits, traditional, postal history, revenue, they put too much text on the page. And so much text in terms of the time that judges have to look at material and look at an exhibit, they don't have time to read it all, okay? so they. Many times we we miss things because there's really important stuff buried in somewhere in the middle of that text. And how often, a couple of times I said to an exhibitor, you know, when you did this, you should have explained this a little bit more. There's a very interesting thing that it wasn't yet. And the exhibitor says, yeah, yeah, but I did, I did, it's there, it's there. And I'll say, oh, okay, I, I missed it. I'm sorry, let's go look at, you know, if you're available, let's go look at the exhibit and see where it is. And he takes me over, she takes me over to the, exhibit and there's a thing there and there's a block of about 18 lines and dark text squeezed together and they say look that fourth sentence there right there that's what you were just saying about and I look at them and say hey yeah but hey you know you just buried it that's the most important thing on that whole page and you buried it in the text and I said he said well I want to give all the background and relevant details uh, -uh. write your book write your monograph uh, you know separately you know, have your, have your, as a reference, your exhibit and your text is designed to explain and understand the material that you're showing, not to go into great, great detail about everything that you've done in this issue of stamps or this type of material. Not too much text, really, really important. And then I think the last one here is that the illustrating illustrations are to use in photocopies must be minimum 25% difference in size from the original. Yes, minimum uh, illustrations, you gotta be very careful. It's a classic problem that the illustrations are more interesting and more colorful and more you know, fun to look at than the actual material. So you step back from the frame and you look at it and all you see are the couple of illustrations and the stamps and the covers just sort of fade into the background. You don't want to do that. You want people to look at the material that you've got. So be careful with using the illustrations. I always suggest, particularly if you're trying to show a detail of a stamp or a printing or a plating flaw or something, use a half tone and make it fairly large and put it over to the side. 
and use, use a little arrow or something to point out where in the stamp this is. And then you can see on the left or the right, the half tone with the detail of what the, what the flaw is. But when you step back from the frame and look at it, you still see the material that the illustration sort of just sort of blends in in the page. It it sounds like it sounds like a trivial thing. It it really isn't. Sometimes this is presentation, and it's important that that people looking at this material see the material. Okay, the stamps, the covers, and not the not the the, the descriptors. I think that's basically. Yeah, that's it. I uh, I. I hope I didn't ramble too much, and but I tried to make a few salient points in traditional exhibiting. It's about the stamps, okay? Well, Peter, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Um, I should let you know that we had, um, at one point or the other, we had over 130 participants, so that's fantastic. <laughs> You you told me to expect about twenty. <laughs> so pleasantly surprised, right? Um, <laughs> well, we'll move on to questions. Let's see. Uh, where did the chat box go? Where did my chat box go? Interesting. Okay, here we go. Let me just close this. Okay, so oh. the first the first question is from Rishi Tulsian. And he writes, of course, he collects classic Nepal and Nepal posters. And his question is, how important do you think is the exhi an exhibit on classic Nepal? Oh, I think it would be very important, sure. And that it gets back to the point that just because it's a smaller, Nepal is smaller than India, is, uh, is the philately of Nepal less important than India? No, Nepal by itself is a very interesting and intricate country. Uh, I mean, I don't collect it myself, but I know something about it. So uh, th that's very important. I, I think uh, a, a really good, I don't know if you get a 10 in importance, but you certainly would be up there eight or nine. Sure. Yeah, of course. Great. Does that, Great. Does that answer the question? I, uh, I, I, I believe that's exactly what he was alluding to. So I think that answers yeah. the question. So you think eight or nine is where you'd end up? Yeah, but I don't, important. you know. But it, right, it doesn't right. mean the that doesn't mean the exhibitor itself, you know, what he's showing would necessarily get that importance. But as a country, yeah, Nepal's a, a very interesting, and I've I've seen good exhibits of Nepal, and there, there, and there's been a lot of research done about it. It's a it's a great subject. Yeah. Great. The next question is from our from Virendra Sharma, and he writes, can we put the pointed reference at the bottom of the same exhibit sheet where we are showing the item itself? Of course, general references would be part of the intro page. Yeah, well, I, I discourage using general references on the intro page because you very likely might be taking away space that you want to do more background about the exhibit itself, okay? So if you if you insist on really important references, I would put them exactly as I said. I think I said that. Put them on the page where the material is, and just but at the bottom, very discreetly. Can we please can, can we please request everybody to mute themselves? Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Rajesh Paharia. He writes, overprint varieties can be better explained by readable size illustration. How much far is it acceptable generally? I I, I don't understand. the. Uh, I, I don't either. <laughs> Rajesh, I'm going to unmute you and maybe you can ask the question. Yes, thanks. Thank You're muted still. Am I on? What? Uh, Speak again, please. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yes. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. I could not uh, express properly with this question. Actually, I am uh, collecting overprints, refugee relief overprints. So I was just wondering that until and unless we explain though the varieties with the illustrations, the readable size, because on stamp, they are too small to understand. Yeah. So we... I... Okay, go ahead. 
So if we explain all the good varieties with illustrations, normally the non-overprint collector would always say that there are too much of illustrations. So what should be the right balance uh, where one should take care, the preference of the learned jury? Well, I, what, I, what I would do is take the overprint and is it, is it each stamp has a different overprint or I mean, are there, are there, was there a common overprint that was used on several different stamps? No, they're, they're, both are there. The, the same overprint with varieties explained and also the different overprints. Okay, well, um, I, I think what I would do is, is, is get a, a scan of the overprint all by itself, not on, on a stamp, and I'm sure you can do that, and yes. blow it up to the size of the regular font on the page and put it over to the left uh, just in where, where it would appropriately be. And you can, uh, some people use a little tiny computer dr driven arrow or something and just point it over to the stamp. And that's all you have to say. You don't have to go into great deal. It's pretty obvious what it is. Just, just well, play around with that. And if it's the same overprint on several stamps, you you don't have to repeat it every time, but yes. any different, every different overprint, I would I would show it, absolutely. It shouldn't take up much space if it's just a, you know, just, just blow it up till it's visible by the, you know, that you comfortably can see it, you know, with your normal glasses or whatever, <laughs> my glasses. Thanks. Perfect, perfect. Thanks for your perfect, perfect. Uh, okay. Thank you, thank you much. Okay, the, the next question is from Saket Bajaj, and he writes, uh, is it necessary to display all the values of a particular set of stamps of an issued year, or can just the most important ones be displayed mainly to save space? Ah, good. That's a very good question. I think, frankly, if you're going to talk about an issue of stamps that has, you know, what, five or six or 10 different, different, you know, values, is that, I assume that would be the difference. I think at least once you have to show, show them all, maybe on the, at, the, at the beginning of the exhibit or wherever it's important in the exhibit, you have to show at least once. Then what you can do is later in the exhibit when you have commonalities to you know the same you know this it, it, something applies to all of those different values you can say that I mean you can say all all stamps in this uh, issue have this same thing something like that you can explain what's the commonality of it but you got to show if it, you're talking about an issue of stamps, you really have to show them all at least once. And you can, many exhibitors do that by just showing the issued values at early in the exhibit after the pre-stamp stuff, uh, show it once and then, you, but you don't have to, uh, you don't have to necessarily go into great detail in each stamp. On the other hand, you're certainly going to get more credit if you can show usages of all of them. So, it it depends on how you how much space you have and if it's a if it's a is, issue that has you know twenty five stamps or something specific stamps then yeah that's that's a little more complicated but you, at least once if it's if you're talking about an issue of stamps you really should show at least one example of all of them. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll end this with one last question and that is: Is it necessary to underline the rarity? of one or other items exhibited by using bold type or italics or even to add a frame around that stamp or cover of postcard? Well, that's what I do. I mean, yeah, <laughs> if it's something really rare and I want to make sure that the, that the viewer, the judge notices it, yes. On the other hand, there's a kind of a rule of thumb that you don't want to have an, in a frame of with 16 pages you don't want to have 12 of them all have highly, everything has a boxed rarity. So you have to have, you got to use a little editorial thing. You got to pick out the really, really top stuff and say, box that and put a red box around it or something. Yeah, do that. For the other things that are very scarce or difficult to acquire, the best thing to do is make a little note in, you know, below saying, you know, one of, 14 examples known or very difficult to acquire. Just a little text right below the stamp or the cover to say that. And the ones that are really the, the top notch, <clears throat> you, should, you should emphasize them by 
a bold thing or a little box or something. What what I do is in my this is not this postal history because it's a little different, but it would apply to what I do. If I have something that's really um, uh, a really good item, I mention it and put a box around it. And I, but I just the 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 mention is only one or two a few words or maybe one sentence. If I have a really something that I I think is you know, going to raise my rarity score by three points that the, the judges notice it. I put the box and then I actually put the description of the rarity in red inside that box. And those judges can't miss that. They go, oh, it's in red. It must be really important. But you have to be careful. Uh, most of the time in in my, in this postal history, but it applies to additional too. In my postal history exhibits, I have maybe in a frame, maybe one or two of those red rarities and some frames none at all so you just you just have to use it but don't don't you don't want every page to have you know red rarities okay because it, and then then it doesn't mean anything right well thank you very much that ends our q a session thank you peter for your wonderful presentation it was a very informative one and this is a token of appreciation from Congress of India. Okay. Yeah.